focused I've been watching for the omens I've been listening to everything you said It's been running through my head Locked and loaded I got the feeling that you know yeah, I've only just begun I won't stop until it's done Till you're broken So welcome to the fire Waiting for this moment, the final battle of the chosen. See, I'm never gonna quit. Got my legacy set in motion. So, welcome to the fire. to the fire cause the bigger they are the harder they fall you build your fortress and I'll climb your walls you got your armor I see your flaws so welcome to the fire To my car, I know what it costs. Yeah, I put in the work that you don't. Day after day, I work in the play. Yeah, I'll do all the things that you won't. Even when my feet get tired, I will keep on moving higher. I'm the story you don't speak of. Cause I want everything or nothing at all Yeah, I want everything or nothing at all Cause I want everything or nothing, 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 nothing at all Don't care what you think or what you believe Cause I'm gonna turn the world upside down If you want a shot, just up in the ring Yeah, I'ma shake your bones like thunder Thing and nothing.
Day one, we started something. And every day since, we've been building on that stronger and stronger and stronger. You with me? Yeah! Are you with me? Yeah! Officer Training School is a eight-week program designed to take civilians straight off the street or prior enlisted members and transform them into leaders for the United States Air Force or the United States Space Force. Have people from all sorts of backgrounds. Kind of the biggest common factor I've seen between students is having that very strong, very personal why that drives students both through this training and through a successful career in the Air Force. So you have to have the confidence to lead, but also the confidence to say, I don't know. We want to challenge you mentally, we want to challenge you with your leadership skills. Push forward this way. But we're also going to challenge you physically. So many people who are coming through OTS right now, getting to hear their perspectives, getting to hear uh, their passion and their passion to serve, it really has just filled me with a confidence about the future of Air Force leadership. One of my favorite aspects about the training is watching the development of someone that just shows up at OTS and see kind of how they take in all the lessons and then the person that they become at the end, someone that's more confident and more ready to lead. Way to be leaders, warriors, and wingmen. I appreciate seeing everybody out there pushing each other and digging deep, and that's what we want to see. My name is Colonel Jeff Pixley. I'm the commander of basic military training. Thank you for joining the United States Air Force. Thank you for raising your hand and promising to give of yourself, to sacrifice, to do something that most Americans never do. Be better every day. Be better. You probably want to know how to be successful in basic military training. Fight for yourself. Don't give up on yourself. And when you're about to, work with each other. Lean on each other because you'll be successful when you're a team. Remember why you are here. Remember those people that came before you. Everything that you do needs to come with a passion and a vigor that is unmatched. When you leave basic military training, you're going to understand how to wear the uniform. You're going to understand what it is to live by the core values, and you're going to know the value of your teammates. If you live up to my expectations, you'll be here seven weeks from today, and you'll be about to graduate. I am an American Airman. I am a warrior. I have answered my nation's call. I am an American Airman. My mission is to fly, fight, and win. I am an American Airman, wingman, leader, warrior. I will never leave an Airman behind. I will never falter, and I will not fail. Hey, everyone. I'm Master Sergeant Holly Patterson. And I'm Master Sergeant Jody Reed, and today we have another special show for you. Um, we also have a lot of special guests on today's set. Uh, we're always talking about preparing you all for basic training and for OTS. So today's show is going to be helping you off. You're already in a delayed entry program. It's going to help you prepare for basic training. So it's going to help you prepare for OTS. And it's also, we have some time to talk about if you're not in a delayed entry program and you're prepping for the ASVAB or you're prepping for the AFOQT. Like always, we're going to give you a chance to ask questions as well. Just make sure you put a Q before your question. That way we know you're asking a question. Um, a lot of you may have noticed uh, Sergeant Cerny is not here. We have a new co-host. So um, she's going to introduce who she is, just so you all can kind of get a background of her. 
Yeah, and if I do too well, I mean, Sergeant Cerny already said, hey, get it, let's go. I'll just replace him forever. Um, I don't mind. Um, <laughs> I'm Master Sergeant Holly Patterson. As I said earlier, I work at Air Education and Training Command Headquarters, Public Affairs. So I uh, work over with the big boss of our training command and do kind of PR type work for the Air Force. So um, I do have a lot of experience, I guess. I've been in 17 years, uh, traveled the world, been to Germany, Iraq, Afghanistan, all those places, done a, done a little bit of combat camera as well. So um, I'm just really happy to be here and um, answer any questions that people have and help move the show along. Awesome. Uh, you hear what she said, Cerny? I did not say that. Uh, <laughs> he said it. He said, you're <laughs> you're coming here forever. So, <laughs> so yeah, Cerny's just out, you all, for this show. So he should be back. Um, but we do have somebody, just in case um, one of us falls out, we all, always have somebody to fill in. So today is going to be Sergeant Patterson. Um, as far as our guests go, like I said, we have some special guests. So first, I want to enter or just let you know we have somebody coming from um, basic training. It's going to be Technical Sergeant Giat. Uh, she's going to be a military training instructor over at basic training and the 319 squadron. And then we also have uh, some civilians on board. This is the first show we've actually had civilians with us. Um, so we have uh, Amanda Mouton, and she's coming from Strategic Research and Assessment Branch over at Air Force Personnel Center. And then we also have Andrew Deregla, and he's coming from the same office. So um, first, I just want to give you all a chance to introduce yourself. So we'll start with, uh, let's start with starting Giat. Where are you coming from? Good afternoon, everyone. I am Technical Sergeant Giat, as uh, previously introduced. I work out of San Antonio Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, where the Air Force has all of its roots. I am from the 319th Training Squadron. I've been working over there for a couple flight cycles now. We are Air Force's newest basic military training and squadron. We stood up just one flight cycle ago. So uh, it's really exciting to be here. I'm excited to hear what questions y'all have for me and what perspectives I can offer you from the basic military training side of the house. Thank you, Sergeant Giat. All right, now we have uh, Andrew DeRegla. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey everyone, my name is Andrew DeRegla, like they mentioned. Um, and like they mentioned before, I'm uh, with the Strategic Research and Assessments Branch, um, and I work as a personnel research psychologist over in San Antonio at Randolph Air Force Base. I've been doing it go coming up on just about four years now. Um, and basically uh, what, what our team works with, we work with um, a lot of entry standards testing, think B, um, they mentioned it, the ASVAB, which y'all will be familiar with. And there's also the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test um, or the AFOQT, among other different tests as well, um, doing things like research and validating tests to ultimately help Air Force leadership uh, make informed decisions on policy. And, um, we're super excited, or I'm super excited to be on today. Um, it's cool to see that we're going to be some of the first civilians on here too, so hopefully the first of many. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. And lastly, we're going to bring on Amanda Mouton. Hey, so I have it easy because I feel like me and Andrew both have the same background, so I could just say retweet on everything he said. Um, I'll just add that, you know, over at the Strategic Research and Assessments Branch at, you know, AFPC, um, a lot of the work we do with like the tests and assessments where we're not just trying to inform policy, but, you know, ultimately we're also trying to kind of get at that like holistic assessment of, you know, future airmen and trying to make sure that we're getting kind of the right folks into the right jobs. So kind of all about that person aspect as well. Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, so I don't know if everybody saw it when when we were waiting for the countdown, but they were putting some questions up on the screen, and I did not do well on any of those questions. I, I don't know it. about everybody else, but <laughs> but it was I wasn't doing so well. Um, so maybe one of you all could um, kind of explain what maybe the ASVAB and the AFOQT um, are for some people out there watching today and kind of what the different purposes of those two tests are. Uh, I can probably start off talking about the ASVAB a little bit. Um, so the ASVAB, um, I guess for anyone who's unfamiliar, you can kind of think of it as if you're not familiar with the you know, SAT, standardized testing. Um, it's basically the test you take to enter into the military. Um, so there's like two, a couple of primary, primary uses for it. So first is just qualifying for a specific branch, right? So to score um, or to get into the Air Force and for different branches, they all have different um, minimum scores you have to make. And then once you make it in two as well, um, there's also the part of having to qualify for specific jobs in the Air Force. So it kind of has like that two parts So getting into the Air Force and then um, 
eventually qualifying for specific jobs, depending on what you get on, depending on what you get on the different scores. Awesome. And so, and then, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. You go ahead. <laughs> so I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I was just going to add that essentially the AFOQT, um, which is the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test, it's kind of you know similar function. Um, as the ASVAB, it's just specifically for uh, officer selection. Um, again, kind of like ASVAB, there are like minimums that you need to meet to just, you know, be able to qualify to become an officer. And then kind of depending on, you know, what careers you're interested in, whether you're interested in like the rated careers where you're like flying or in the non-rated careers, um, there can be kind of some additional kind of minimum score requirements to meet um, to qualify for those specific careers as well. Thank you so much. So a lot of the people, you know, when I used to recruit, um, it, it, believe it or not, people um, didn't do as well on the ASVAB or AFOQT test as they would have liked to a lot of the time. So a lot of people would ask, like, what's the best way I can prepare for the ASVAB or prepare for the AFOQT? So if you all could give them some advice, like the nitty gritty of preparing, what would you tell them? Um, I can kind of start up on that too. So uh, like I mentioned, you can kind of think of it as like, you know, like the SAT or the SAT, ACT type test to where, um, you know, if you kind of prep for that, it, it might it'd probably be like a similar experience. Um, so, you know, just want to get familiar with like the types of questions. Um, obviously, you know, we can't endorse any type of particular, you know, test prep, but trying to get some type of structured test prep for yourself is a good way to start it. And then it's going to be a lot of be a lot of, you know, um, self-motivation so trying to structure it out giving yourself enough time to actually you know study out you know specific parts you know what and, and part of that too is also like knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are so maybe you know if you're um, kind of strapped for time right and you're like i only have x amount of time to study for the test maybe you want to focus on you know the math portion or the verbal portion too but a lot of it's going to come down to you know picking the right prep um and kind of structuring that yourself um, I don't know, the, and I know on the Air Force, you know, we had like in the beginning of the stream, we had some of those like sample questions and stuff right. like that. I know on the Air Force site as well, if you look on, I think it's airforce.com slash ASVAB, I think is that too. They have some sample questions on there and some actual information too on, you know, you can actually see like, you know, with specific ASVAB scores, like what kind of jobs can I qualify for too? And they have some sample questions there too. So that could be like a start if you're looking to start prepping. Just take the sample questions from the website and see where you're at. Yeah, that could be a good way to start, like a good baseline, just to see maybe where your knowledge is at. Okay. And I think at the recruiting station, sometimes you can take a practice, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, the, the recruiting stations usually have a practice test or what they call the APT. And I don't know what the APT stands for, but it's a <laughs> practice test you can take online. Um, or you can get with the recruiter to take that as well. Okay, yep. okay. And, oh, and I guess we can talk about the AFOQT as well. Yeah, I mean, kind of similar boat. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the best things you can do kind of off the offset is just honestly, like research, like try and figure out as much information as possible about like what the test is like, um, what the test format is like. So if you're taking it, you know, paper pencil versus like computerized, you know, there is kind of slight differences there um, where the computerized looks a little bit, you know, a little bit shorter. Um, and so just kind of getting as much info as possible about kind of what to expect. Cause I think you don't want to kind of show up on test day and maybe you've been doing all your prep based on a, a paper and pencil version and you get there and it's electronic, you know, like any kind of little thing that can kind of start kind of psyching you out like test day, try and kind of prepare for those things. So I think ultimately it's just a very long test. Um, I can tell a funny, funny story about that. So back when uh, myself and Andrew, we actually started as interns on our team and Kind of a, a good way for us to kind of get familiar with the test and kind of learn the format is we actually got the opportunity to take AFOQT ourselves and kind of see um, kind of what the content looks like and the different subtests and everything. And <laughs> God bless our supervisor. She she told us that it was like a two hour test. Um, I will tell you, it is not a two hour test. It is like a five hour test. So. Um, that's kind of what we're getting at with like kind of the prep stuff. So um, I'm sitting there taking it and I'm thinking it's a two hour test and the subtest just kind of kept coming. And I almost like being an intern, I'm like, is this, is this a loyalty test here? Right. Do I like keep, keep taking it? Do I sit this out? Like it's kind of getting late. It's kind of getting close to 4 p.m. Like, what do I do here? It almost turned into like its own like SJT of sorts. Right. I'm like, am I tested in this? So 
that's just kind of a great example, funny example that like kind of just know like the length, the format, kind of what to expect. And um, even the question types, because like even though you can't access like the actual content itself, just getting familiar with the types of questions, kind of what to expect, I think is kind of one of the best ways to, to prep. Got it. Thank awesome. You so much. Awesome. Yeah. So um, do you recommend maybe taking up, you know, going in and, and going in and um, sorry, figuring out the types of questions and things by taking it and then possibly taking it again later? Or do you think it's best to just try to give your best at, at one time? Like how long can you take it after if you didn't do so well on it, I guess? And how many times can you take them um, for both tests, the ASVAB and the AFOQT? So I know for the for the ASVAB, um, at least when you take after you take it the first time, it has to be at least another 30 days between mm -hmm. first and second administration. And then I think if you take it a third time, it's also another 30 days. And then I believe someone can correct me if I'm wrong. It's after the third attempt. You have to wait. I think it's about six months. So there's kind of like that stretch there. Yeah, that's um, correct. But definitely, um, it, it could be personal opinion. But what I would say is definitely give it your best shot on the first first attempt as well, too. Just to give it, you know, because, you know, in a, in a way you do have kind of a limited attempt. And, you know, the, the better you do, the better you're, um, like, the better spot you're in, too. Because, um, you know, research does say, you know, if you do, if you're not satisfied, you retest and, you know, you prep accordingly, things like that. You are expected to improve, you know, it's just saying, as long as you, like, prep and study and use your, you know, experience and stuff like that. But I would say definitely at least give the first um, first attempt the best um, the best try it can be, basically. Got it. Yeah. What about the AFOQT? Yeah, I would agree. Same thing kind of for the AFOQT. I think... You know, on that first attempt, I mean, you might surprise yourself, you know, if you prep, you know, you, maybe you'll do better than you expect. And then even if you don't, now that you've kind of known, okay, like I prepped a certain way this first time, maybe that wasn't, you know, near as like effective this first time. Maybe I need to switch something up versus like kind of going in just kind of cold and not really knowing kind of what to expect kind of thing. So, and like I said, you know, it, it's a long test. It's a five hour test. So, you know, I naturally probably wouldn't recommend just going in and just casually taking a five hour <laughs> test with no prep. Um, I'm sure there's probably some people maybe that do that just so they can kind of see like the content. But I, I agree that I think probably make the best of your time and, you know, prep as you can go in, do your best, but then just know that, you know, that it is an option to be able to retest um, for AFOQT. You'll just have to wait at least 90 days before the, the test attempts. Um, so it's a pretty shortened window. It's actually been decreased in the past couple of years. It used to be a little bit of a longer retest window. So just know that that's like an option and maybe that'll kind of help alleviate kind of some anxiety behind like, oh, I have to show up and just um, do my absolute best on the first time that you, you do get another attempt. Um, and then additionally, kind of with the, the super scoring as well, you know, maybe you go in, you study, you prep, you do really well on, you know, some sections the first time. Well, maybe that second time you can kind of focus on on a different portion that you want to improve, like maybe you want to uh, improve quant so you can kind of focus more of your study on quant and then still kind of maintain um, whatever verbal score you got on it, too. So um, kind of just keeping that in mind, like there's options, but I, I think definitely make the best of your time because five hours is a long yeah. time to be studying. <laughs> and, and just to be so. I, just to be sure, the AFOQT only allows you to take that test twice. I believe you can take it a third time, but it, it would require a waiver for the third time. Okay, got it. Um, uh, Randy, you had an aviation comp competency competency test up. Uh, you wanted me to ask about that. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, what about the a aviation competency test? Too bad. Um, I'm not sure what that is. The T the T bath. The T bath. Yes. Is it the T bath? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the TBAS, it's, um, it's an additional test that you have to take if you're kind of interested in being a pilot or an RPA pilot. Um, it is separate from AFOQT. So it's about an hour and 15 minutes long. Um, and you'll have to find a location. So we have kind of a listing of like all the different locations that the, you can take the TBAS at. So like I said, it is kind of a, a separate test from AFOQT. Um, but it is necessary to take and get a, get scores on it if you're interested in being like a pilot or an RPA pilot. So um, it, if so you're interested in, oh, I was going to say, if you're interested in non-rated positions, you wouldn't need to take that? No, if you're interested in uh, being a pilot or an RPA pilot, so just one, one of the types of rated positions. So if you're interested in like being an 
an ABM or a CISO, like you don't need to take a TFAS. It's just for pilots. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Okay. So we are going to um, move over um, to Tech Sergeant Giat, ask you a few questions about basic training. And then, of course, we're going to get to a question and answer session fairly soon. So keep those questions coming in. Um, make sure you put a cue on those questions so that we know that you um, have a question that you want us to answer. But um, let's get over to her. Uh, so you're a basic military training instu- instructor. Um, a lot of people call that an MTI or a TI. Uh, can you just kind of give us a rundown of what that means? What do you do? What What does that typical day look for you? Holy smokes, are there typical <laughs> days at MTI? <laughs> uh, um, so yes, absolutely. So I've been a military training instructor for a little over a year and a half now. Y'all have to excuse my voice. I uh, called the card out at PT this morning. Uh, <laughs> so we are responsible for doing physical training with you, teaching you how to do that physical training, calling the card in the cadence, as you can hear in my voice. We'll also teach drill. We take them through a series of professional lessons and developmental Air Force core values and things of that nature. Uh, We also teach you how to walk, talk, and act like an airman. So we have a level of expectations that comes with the mantle of being an Air Force member. And we're not any longer in the business of breaking down to build up. We know that everybody comes in with a really good foundation. Uh, between the morals and the ethics and the things that they came up with. And so the Air Force is really interested in building on the greatness that you already have and utilizing that to really further the mission long term. So as an MTI, I come in every day with the expectation and the hope that I can really tap into those individual trainees and have them reach their fullest potential. I tell all of my new flights, hey, the average MTI believes more in the average trainee than they ever will in themselves because we see thousands of you right. uh, a year, and we know what you're capable of. So uh, basic training has changed a lot, uh, especially since I've joined. Uh, it's probably changed a lot since you've joined. Could you walk us through some of the changes that you've seen since you uh, since you were an airman in basic training and to now as an MTI? Absolutely. Uh, so one of the biggest things that we have now is enhanced integration. Previously, some of you may have gone through what we called Airman's Week, where there was the seven weeks of basic military training, and then the eighth week, you kind of integrated and got those professional lessons, the fantastic What Now Airmen's um, that some of us are familiar with. Um, So we've seen some changes to the actual integration of the flight makeup, meaning that males and females are integrated within their specific flights. All the dormitories are separated but males and females get the opportunity to learn, grow, and be educated together on what the Air Force expectation is. That's going to be your largest change to basic military training by and far. The other biggest change is that we've moved from the classic dormitories that individuals are used to seeing to the airman training complexes. So we as MCIs have affectionately deemed them Disneyland, uh, Mm -hmm. and then some of us will call them, call ours the old buildings Alcatraz. But I can assure you, you'll get the same quality of training no matter if you come through an RHNT or an ATC Airman Training Complex, which is our newer installations. There's been a lot of changes to curriculum over time as well to meet the intent of the Air Force mission going forward, ensuring that we are creating the most highly capable and highly adaptable airmen the Air Force has seen to date. There's going to be a lot that's expected of you as trainees as airmen as individuals that are coming into the military period dot and so the curriculum has been molded over time to meet that need we've also revised a series of the physical training requirements in order to get everybody from a state of couch to bmt in a quicker and more effective fashion without the induced stress to the individual so we have put a lot of time and effort into the physiology of physical training, as well as the endurance of the actual individual and their resilience that we're hoping to cultivate in them long-term. Awesome. Just a lot of changes. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. <laughs> and I went through 17 years ago, so I'm sure it's a lot different now. Um, but you mentioned uh, a really a change in curriculum. Um, so 
I think a lot of people tend to think that BMT is going to be physically taxing on them, and and they often ask questions about how to prepare for basic training um, physically, but it's obviously mental mentally challenging as well. Um, so can you talk about uh, the physical challenges as well as the mental challenges that come with basic training? Absolutely. So physically, uh, BMT kind of intimidates a lot of people because they're like, oh, I'm going to be doing a lot more running and push-ups and sit-ups. But the biggest issue that, or not issue, but the the injuries that we tend to see individuals experience within the first couple of weeks of training is through basic walking. <laughs> so the average individual, I know that sounds funny to say, <laughs> but we spend a lot of time on our feet. We've gotten very used as a society to, oh, I can sit on my couch, I can do my work from home, I can sit in a desk chair. And the first couple of weeks in BMT, your only mode of transportation are your Chevrolet legs or your Lamborghinis. It's not wheels on a car, it's you. And so going up and down stairs, transiting, i.e. doing drill, doing PT, moving in an excess of what you're used to causes a lot of physical strain on the body. So if you are looking at coming into the military, I do highly recommend getting that movement in now. Um, the, the mental stressors are obviously separation from family members. That's always difficult. But I tell my individuals that are having that homesickness, hey, luckily for you, this is kind of as hard as it gets. I mean, deployments are going to be hard on you, but at least you got your cell phone and your laptop every day at that. So if you can get through VMT, if you can get over the uh, mental state of it, just like with running, uh, <laughs> you will be just fine. You just got to put yourself at that finish line and keep visualizing. All right. We actually have a video we want to show. It's about um, getting uh, the physical uh, requirements in basic training. So we're going to go ahead and queue up that video right now. My name is Technical Sergeant Gia, and I'm a military training instructor here at the 319th Training Squadron. What tends to scare trainees most about coming to BMT, aside from the MTIs themselves, is often the physical fitness test. So today I'm here with Mr. G.T. Metten, who is our BMT physiologist. I also have Technical Sergeant Kenton, who is our 319th Training Squadron PT Supply NCOIC. We're going to go over some of the exercises that you can expect to perform here at BMT how you can go ahead about start practicing them at home and we're going to go over your run form so that you can be ready to go when you get here. One of the most failed components in the Air Force PT assessment are the sit-ups. Your feet will be flat on the ground and a wingman will be holding your feet in place. You will engage your core, press your lower back into the ground and raise your shoulders until your elbows reach either your thigh or your knee. The next component of the Air Force physical fitness test is the push-up. To initiate the push-up, you will bend at the elbow and lower your chest down towards the ground until your elbows form no wider than a 90 degree angle or until your upper arm is parallel with the ground. To perform the squat, you will initiate the movement by moving the hips backwards slightly and bending in the knee. As you perform this movement, you want to ensure that your knees stay wide enough that they follow in line with your toes and make an effort to keep your chest up in the bottom of the movement. A great core strengthening exercise is the side plank. To get into position for the side plank, you will lay on one side or the other, and then you'll contract your core to raise your hips off the ground until your body forms a straight, rigid line. Running is a large component of military fitness and becoming a tactical athlete. You should run with a high cadence, meaning that you should be taking near 180 steps per minute. When striding it out, the focus should be on maintaining a short step in front while pushing and driving the ground for distance behind you. Once you arrive at BMT, you'll be expected to spend much time on your feet. Trainee during their first several weeks of BMT spends well over 20,000 steps per day on their feet. This increase in volume can be stressful on the body. What we recommend is following the Air Force Delayed Entry Program apps walk to run progressions which can be found in the training tab. Awesome. Thank you so much for that video. That was very informative. Like the 20,000 steps a day. I had no idea <laughs> that I felt it. I, I felt, felt it when it. I went through, I, I, but I think we did walk. 20, I think we, I think maybe we walked more than that. <laughs> <Yes>. I'm not, 
<laughs> but Definitely. in the Texas heat, but for sure, for sure. Um, so a quick question that I have, because maybe it seems silly, but a lot of the folks who are watching um, don't have a lot of experience with the military. So who goes to basic training? Because we talked about the ASVAB and we, we talked about um, the AFOQT and the different routes. So does everybody go to basic training or how does that work? So I'll start. I'm sure uh, our other two individuals will have a little bit more information as far as specific routes. Most individuals looking to do active duty as well as guard and reserve will come through a form of basic military training if their intent is to be an enlisted member. And we see everyone from 17 year olds to 39 year olds. And you would be amazed at the capability that these individuals showcase and it's not just you know your high school graduates or your people looking for a new change or a new career i had an individual two flight cycles ago that had their doctorate we had another that was a knee surgeon and so it's individuals from all walks of life that are looking for a higher purpose of meaning and they're looking for a specific type of service as well so there's really no left or right bounds as far as who comes in or why they comes in and we're just thrilled to death that they are and we're ready to get them from point A to point B as quick as we can and then push them out to do really great things in the Air Force. Awesome. And uh, well, a quick reminder, um, I know we've got a lot of questions in the in the comments, so we are going to do Q&A very shortly. So thank you all for your patience, um, but make sure you keep asking those questions and keep marking it with um, a cue so that we know, because even if we don't get to all of your questions here today, uh, we will have some folks uh, stand back and trying to answer those questions on whatever platform that you've answered or asked it on. So um, don't get discouraged. Uh, we will try to get all those questions answered for you. Um, but that'll be in just a few minutes. We'll get to that question and answer. And also the uh, phone number that you all saw on the screen, there's somebody standing by you can call uh, and they will be able to answer your questions, whether or not we're on the show or not. That number is always a live number you can call and get your questions answered all right so the we said that that for basic training that's going to be your 17 39 year olds that are coming on the enlisted path so the I guess the officer path are you an MTI over there or are you only an MTI at basic training so I am a, an MTI at basic military training. However, a lot of times they will actually pull MTIs up to the academy so that we can MTI in Colorado. Um, we also have the privilege of working with the officer candidates in a summer student leadership program where a lot of off, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of individuals that are looking to commission and graduate from the Air Force Academy will come down and spend a couple weeks with us as MTIs, see how we run business, see how we lead. And then they'll take that back for the Air Force um, officer side of basic military training. So they have their own program that they operate under and they'll do that alongside MTIs, but we get the opportunity to show them what that NCO leadership looks like for them to take back with them so that they can create a more fulfilling program for the other candidates as well. Wow. I didn't know that. That's, 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 that's really very awesome. informative. And I, I also want to point out, too, is, you know, we've got two civilians on, on the show with us that um, a lot of folks get discouraged that maybe they don't qualify for service, but there's still a way that you can serve. And Civilians is a great program. Um, G, the GS Civilian Program um, is, a, is a great way, a great path to still be able to serve your country. Right. And, you know, when we talk about airmen, um, or Department of the Air Force, Guardians, Airmen, um, we mean everybody. That includes our civilians as well. Right. There are airmen in our Air Force. So Right. That is definitely uh, super important. A lot of, a lot of people don't, uh, don't even know that we have civilian career fields. So would you all be able to run us through the process of how you ended up working for the Air Force as a civilian? Yeah, I, I could probably get started. Amanda probably have a lot to say, too, because we kind of went through the same kind of pipeline. But... When we started a few years back, it was around 2019, um, Amanda and I actually, out of out of grad school, we started um, working for the Air Force through the through the PCIP program, the PCIP program, which stands for the Premier College Internship Program, uh, which starts off like it's like um, like in the name, starts off as like an internship, um, and then so for that, typically you would work like a summer. Um, I think it's like 12, 12 weeks or so, and then 
when you, you know, if you decide, you know, you wanted to stay, it kind of goes from the intern program to what's now called the PAC program or um, Palace Acquired Program, PAQ. And that's basically like a follow up to the internship um, where you um, kind of depends where you are in your schooling, but it's like two to three years you work for the Air Force and you kind of make, you know, progressions through. And then after that, with the end goal of, you know, getting outplaced, they call it to a permanent position in the uh, civilian service, pretty much. So it's so the PSIP and PAC programs are two um, how we both got in. And it's a really good way to kind of get into the GS system because it gives you like a nice, you know, a smooth like pipeline into the program if you want it to become like um, a career civilian, basically. Wow. I did not know that. That's a lot of information. (laughs) (laughs) And your process was the same, Amanda? Yeah, yeah, same process. Um, I'll just kind of add to that even even better yet. So we were a little bit different in that we were already kind of in a like a master's program, like in grad school. Um, But really, typically, most like uh, PSIP interns kind of start like an undergrad. So you can start as soon as like undergraduate studies, Um, you know, just look on the I think Air Force civilians website, there should be some information on like the PSIP. And then um, if you're still interested in and working for the Air Force, you know, past that internship. There's also like Andrew mentioned, like the PAC program. Um, so just great way to kind of get experience all in one spot um, with the same team and um, kind of just being able to kind of develop with the same team is like a really great experience and great way to learn. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Now we're going to get into the uh, part m- most of our audience is waiting for. This is the c- question and answer time. So. Like I say in the beginning of the show and throughout the show, if you all have questions, this is the time to ask. Just put a cue before your question. That way we know you're asking a question. And we're going to get it started. All right. Hi. Is it possible as a non-U.S. citizen to participate in any activities? I have been in the Danish Air Force, but I'm not a veteran. I only have the basic military education. Hmm. As a non-U.S. citizen and you were in the Danish Air Force. Um, So you're gonna first wanna get the green card. You're gonna wanna have that or a US citizenship. Now being part of the Danish Air Force, um, that's gonna possibly cause some issues as well as far as your entry. Um, um, I'm trying to just think off the top of my head. I do believe that the Air Force allows, er, there's a possibility for people to join if they served in another country's military, but there's a lot of, um, I think it actually requires an exception of policy in order for you to do that. So I would say if you have a U.S. citizenship or if you have a green card, reach out to a recruiter and then they'll be able to help you with the rest of it as far as the Danish Air Force. They'll be able to help you out with that and see if there's a possibility there. In your experience, what was the worst day or week for basic training? Uh, I don't know who that's aimed at, but I will say, um, for me, I actually uh, suffered an injury in basic training. And so I got removed from my flight and I had to go to med hold. And so I think that was probably the worst time. Not that it was an awful experience, but um, you build a lot of camaraderie. Uh, in basic and you know you go through some things the very first week that you're there and um, for me being separated from those people that I just became friends and family with in such a short period of time um, to be separated from them and then see them graduate later like see them all in their blues and everything walking around with their families and ice cream cones and I'm (laughs) still sitting there but hey we made it we made it but for me I know that's probably not the question that they wanted they wanted to like hear about the food was awful or something but for me um really the the friendships that you make in basic training and the camaraderie and the teamwork because you're just thrown so much at you know initially in the beginning um that was the hardest for me was probably seeing them graduate without me (laughs) I say my my first night, like I remember laying in the bed and I was mad at myself because I have just been yelled at. <laughs> I've been walking, I've been marching, and and I'm just sitting in the bed like, what did I do? I did this. Like nobody <laughs> this forced me to come here. I'm just here. Um, I volunteered for this. <laughs> yeah. So I was a little mad at myself, but I would say about um, maybe second or third week was when it was like okay. Like, I, I'm, I'm here, um, I we can, can do, do this. this. Yeah, but that first <laughs> night, that was a rough night. Oh, it was yeah. a rough night for uh, me. 
I blocked what, that out of my memory. What about you, Sergeant Giat? Oh, man. <laughs> I think if you ask any of my trainees right now, they would tell you zero night when they got dropped off. Yeah. But uh, I tell them, hey, it's only, a, it's only really a bad day at Air Force Base at military training if you didn't learn something. Mm -hmm. And that could be because an MTI yelled at you or, you know, you got upset with another a fellow wingman or something of that nature. Uh, it's always super unfortunate when someone does get injured and we send them to med hold or there are like extenuating circumstances that happen. But I tell them all the time, hey, just like everything else in life, this is mental. It's only a failure if you walk away from it and you didn't learn anything. And so even the bad days are when you're like, okay, this happened. It's upsetting. But you know what? I'm either not going to do that again, or I know who to go talk to, and I know how to get the information I need in order to be successful, so that this bad day isn't any worse later on. Right. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I I had another bad day in basic training. Uh, it was my birthday in, uh, in basic training, so that was not a good day. <laughs> <laughs> you had to celebrate there was no invasive. chocolate cake there was no happy birthday it, that was not that was just, not so fun either but <laughs> but but she's right um you know looking back everything's recoverable every bad day every worse week every you think you're just why did i do this right. why am i here can i survive this and honestly looking back you're like why was i so stressed right. out like we will be fine so you'll be fine <laughs> definitely all right it says um i have a felony how does that affect me wanting to join so it'll really depend on the felony that you have um I, you know i i put in somebody with a waiver before with a felony um but it was a it was a silly felony like they they had removed the fire hydrant from a hotel and started spraying the fire or i'm, I'm sorry the fire extinguisher they were spraying it in a hotel um, so that's a felony. Um, but <clears throat> as far as joining the Air Force, it wasn't something that they deemed as, okay, this person can't join. Um, so it really depends on the, the nature of your felony um, and, and how, how big it was. And, um, and if it was too big, then maybe not. Maybe you won't get a waiver. Um, but if it wasn't, then maybe you can. But that's going to depend on your recruiter and your recruiter's leadership if they're willing to give you a waiver. So I would say first reach out to a recruiter um, and then see if they are interested or willing to work with your waiver and then go from there. Good information. I don't know. Will the Air Force be looking at IST inter-service transfer to the Space Force soon? The application is now found on my vector, but is there more info in regard to its process? I don't know. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. I don't have that answer. I'm, yeah, so I'm the expert on the Space for, or on the Air Force. Hey, uh, it's Major Lane from the background. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so they are, the, the issue with uh, Space Force is that they are doing really well at recruiting. And so unfortunately they, you know, they, they meet their goals and then it's a competitive process. But yes, they are looking into it. They are uh, recruiting for the uh, career fields that they need. And um, you would just, again, my vector is the place you would want to go. But, yes, they are currently recruiting. It's just that they're doing really well at it. Yeah. They don't, they don't need uh, to create a buzz. The buzz is there. They don't need us. <laughs> they don't need us. All right. Next question. Uh, this one is a award. Woo. Oh. Just passed MEPS Monday for the Air Force. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Oh! Oh! Yes. So now is the delayed entry program. Uh, that could seem long, but it will. Basic training will come. Um, just get with the get with your recruiter. Get yourself um, a job. I'm hearing a lot of static um, coming in. Just want to make sure all the phones are off and um, yeah, mine's in, off in airplane mode. That way we don't get that static coming in like that. Okay. Well, I was gonna order some some cheeseburgers to be delivered here. But oh. I won't now. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I, I get hungry. I'm that. sorry. I could um, use it. I could, right? Yeah. All right. Um, okay, do we have more questions? What is the age limit for the U.S. Air Force? So that that's going to, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I had a uh, major lane from the background still. Mike, hot. Um, so, yes, the age limit is going to be 17 to 39. You have to be in basic training before your 40th birthday. Um, that's for both officer and enlisted. Um, however, if you're trying to be a pilot, why do I keep forgetting this age? Is it 33? 33 was the age cutoff? You can't be a pilot after 33. I could be wrong. Um, but it's not the same for the normal Air Force age requirement. Uh, pilot is different. Um, but if you're just trying to join the Air Force, 17 to 39. And then the academy is a younger age, too, maybe? Oh, you have to be, um, I think you have to be in the academy maybe? before your 23rd birthday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different age yeah. limits. So uh, I recommend reaching out and um, asking that question that specifically involves you. But right. um, I'm almost to the age limit. And let me tell you, I wouldn't join <laughs> at this <laughs> at this age. But there's some people out there that are, you know, yeah, they're I, real motivated. They're I can, real um, motivated. I see a now. lot of like 38. I actually put in a 39-year-old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and we made it. He was it's still fit, still good to go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, you get all kind of different ages. I hear you though. I'm at thirty. I'm thirty-seven as well. Yeah. And I'm, I just but think about it. I will say though, looking back um, at the people that I've interacted with who are a little bit older, whether it was in basic training, having somebody older in there, or just at your first duty assignment, um, they just bring such a different wealth of knowledge right. um, and just experience and. I mean, I felt old when I joined because I joined at 21 right. and compared to the 17, 18 year olds, like I was an old lady. I had lived, I had gone to college, yeah. I had my own apartment, I've like, you know, lived out on my own. Um, so I did feel older compared to them. But I think having as many people from different backgrounds is, I'm not trying to like plug too much right, here, right. but but really, uh, you know, I joked that I wouldn't join that old, but um, I think that there's just such a benefit for having um, that experience. And that's another good reason to consider being a civilian as well, because right. our civilians have such a wealth of knowledge. So right. I, I always know. told, I always told my older applicants when they were joining, I said, you know, you're going to be like mom, you're going to yep. be pops. Mm -hmm. They're going to lean on you. You're going to be teaching <laughs> children. Cause you know, if you think about it, a lot of folks, maybe the folks watching or even that join at 17, 18, they've never left home. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the Air Force family is not just teaching them how to do their job and, and getting them through basic training, but um, Sergeant um, Giat could probably, you know, say, yes, I this we have this problem, but, you know, teaching them basic skills sometimes. Um, so basic training isn't just running all day long. It's right. it's teaching them basic skills and then getting them set up for success for the rest of their career. That's, so. that, that leads me to I want to ask a question for Sergeant Gia. Your older applicants to come in, how do you handle them or or what advice do you have for them? Uh, two part. OK, so. My older applicants obviously are the ones that come in with a certain level of life experience that we obviously want to capitalize on. Mm -hmm. No, if you're the oldest person in your dormitory, you're not going to be made dorm chief immediately, at least not in mine. I guess I can't speak to all of BMC, um, but we do appreciate those people because we have individuals that come in that may have never done their own laundry before. Right. So um, it's nice to have a, a contrast in the ages because that's where we really start to see the generation gaps that they're going to experience when they're working in the active duty air force or guard or reserve um because the the generation gap and the way that we communicate and we work together is something that especially post covid like post covid that we're seeing as an issue amongst individuals and so having the opportunity to really teach them constructive communication skills, hey, capitalize on this individual's life experience, listen to the younger individual's perspective, just because, you know, you've got maybe 10 years on them doesn't mean that they don't have something that's valuable for you as well. And that's across the age spectrum, that's across the culture spectrum. Um, I don't handle any of my trainees any differently when it comes to development. I think that everybody comes in at a certain baseline because that's what we expect of trainees in the zero week of training, moving from civilian to airman. And so although I'll have to sometimes alter my communication delivery based on the individual in order to get the right message across, um, trainees are, are trainees and it, it's fun to watch the dynamics play out with the older and the youngers 
um, based on their personal goals and why it is that they even joined in the first place. Right. Because that's really where we see the younger and the older generation start to gain that mutual respect of one another. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. And could you please speak about what scores are ideal? Oh, that's a good, great, great question. So for both ASVAB and AFLQT, uh, what scores do you all say are ideal? Or is that relative? I, I could talk about ASVAB a little bit, but I, I will say the answer is very relative like to your specific situation. Because I know um, if you're familiar with AFSCs or AFSCs or Air Force specialty um, specialty codes, it's just like, you know, specific jobs in the Air Force. And um, each one has different ASVAB requirements that you have to meet in terms of like minimum score that you have to meet to qualify for each one. So if you want to join like a cyber career field, you'll need to get, um, you know, around like this this range. Maintainers have their own set. So it, it is, I know that, I don't know how helpful of an answer that is, but it is kind of dependent on your interest um, and then ultimately needs of the Air Force too. So it's kind of a combination of both what you're interested in and then what the Air Force has available. Um, but that, that information is available though, like I mentioned on the Air Force website. So if you actually look at, um, they actually have, I think they have a slider that has like the different um, score, the ASVAB scores. And if you kind of adjust it, you can actually see which AFSCs that you can qualify for though. So that, that actually might be a good, um, good way to tailor it to yourself for your interests. Awesome. And the AFOQT, is it the same kind of thing? It's just going to be relative based off of what you're trying to do? Yeah, same thing. Um, I think, you know, if you're interested in any of like those rated career fields, so like, for example, being a pilot or like a remote pilot, ABM, CISO, um, any of those kind of rated career fields, there are kind of like those additional composite requirements in addition to the minimums. So for like AFOQT, just to qualify, you have to get a minimum 15 on the verbal portion and then a 10 on the quant version. And then again, those are minimums. So, um, you know, the Air Force has got a lot of smart folks in it. So, you know, a lot of people tend to score, you know, well above the minimums, but that's kind of like a baseline to go off of and then can always score higher than that. Um, and then again, if you're kind of interested in specific careers, um, there's kind of like those additional minimum requirements for some of the composites for some of those rated careers. Um, and then probably same thing for the, the non-rated careers. So um, again, kind of part of that research, so kind of look into, you know, what are some potential jobs that you might be interested in um, and kind of use that to try and tailor your study too, where you're like, oh, I need to get, you know, this certain score to be able to qualify for this job. But then just kind of knowing that, you know, the minimums we're providing probably a lot of times people are scoring, you know, above the minimums, but it can kind of give you a goal to, to shoot for and how to kind of prep and prepare yourself. Got it. Thank you so much. This is all such great information. I like I didn't know any of this coming here today. So thanks for all these answers. Um, do you have any, um, I guess, advice? I know we're taking questions, but I just had a quick question um, for when you're taking the tests. Like, I know we talked about prep, like study stuff, but is there like a good time a day to take the test? Like certain foods to eat, anything that can like help get you that advantage? I mean, I guess if I had to give an answer, I'm like the, the best time of day to take the test is the time of day that you were best. So, I mean, you know yourself. <laughs> better than anybody. So it's like, if you are not a morning person, try not to take the test, you know, at 8 a.m. where you're kind of still waking up and trying to kind of get going. Um, you know, I think when we were doing like the, the mic check, right? And we we're like, oh, what did everyone have for breakfast this morning? You find out some of us like to eat breakfast. Some of us just need to be caffeinated. So, I mean, I think it's so kind of, you know, variable to the person, but kind of that's something else that you could even kind of practice in your prep is like what what works for me, you know, and even right. if you're kind of maybe superstitious and you need to wear your lucky shirt or something too, like kind of just find those small ways to kind of get yourself comfortable on that, on that test day. Um, I know you're kind of asking about test day, but even going back to like preparing, you know, put yourself under those time constraints. Cause I think that tends to be where a lot of people kind of get a little panicky or get, you know, anxious is like the, the ticking timers. So if you're not prepping under those conditions, then, you know, test day is going to be probably a bit shocking. So just try to emulate the conditions as well as you can. And then as much as you can control, try and, you know, control. <laughs> right. 
All right. Thank you so much. They didn't ask me what I ate for breakfast. I'm, just, I'm, the, new, I'm the new guy here, so they probably ask Sergeant Cerny what he want, what he had for breakfast when he's on, but they didn't ask me, just so you guys know. <laughs> do, do we have any more questions out there? Let's see what else we got. Hopefully. We are going to post the recording after, yes, here on YouTube and, and Facebook, right? Yep. You'll get it on YouTube, Facebook, I think on LinkedIn. You should be able to see it afterwards as well. Yep. So for those folks, I know some people were saying in the chat that they missed the beginning. You can go back and watch it and um, watch those videos as well. And, um, yeah, we'll have it for you. Yep. All right. Next question. I am a transportation engineer, U.S. permanent resident. If I want to join in U.S. Air Force, then what would be my career path? Um, so you first, like I say, you would have to get the either U.S. citizenship or a green card. Um, if you have either one of those, uh, then you would just go to a recruiter and then, then you'll figure out the enlistment process. Um, you're going to be required to take an ASVAB. You're also going to be required to go to MEPS and do a physical. Based off of those two things, those are going to determine your eligibility and your qualifications for jobs. Um, so, But you, the first thing you want to do is get with that recruiter, set it up, and see if you can even start that process. That'd be my advice to you. Yeah, and then if you go to the uh, Air Force's website, you can look at all the different careers that are available, and you can try to find something that, I guess, links you with what your experience is, but you don't necessarily need to do something in the Air Force that you have experience in. Right. Like, we provide everything. Um, if you want to be a civilian in the Air Force, then you'd probably need some experience or education to be qualified for those those jobs, um, certain jobs. But, yeah, if – you can yeah. do kind of kind of whatever you want as long as you qualify for it. So yeah. that's why that ASVAB is so important as well. There may be something you want to do and you don't qualify for it. Right. Um, different jobs have different – there's a – you know, I think they spoke on it a little bit. But, you know, there's a minimum. But then obviously the, the better you do, um, the more opportunities you have. So Definitely. And the thing about coming in as a non-U.S. citizen, it, it kind of sucks um, because – they're very limited on what they can mm -hmm. can do. The right. Air Force boils down their their opportunities to like, I want to say like maybe thirty to forty jobs that they're capable of doing, and that's if they max out the ASVAB. So right. it's just like, make sure if you're a U, non U.S. citizen, you do as good as you can on the ASVAB because you're already going to be limited mm -hmm. on job opportunities. So you want to crush the ASVAB as much as possible. Right, and then obviously there's an opportunity to become a U.S. citizen once you join as well, but uh, it's still probably better to do that ahead right. of time just to, again, give yourself as many opportunities as possible. Definitely. All right. Let's see what we got here. <clears throat> Is it true a graduating high school student needs to go to college before attending the air force academy well isn't the air force academy college. a college <laughs> yeah. so no we don't have to do that um i can't speak a whole lot on it um there are a lot of qualifications to go to the air force academy um including needing um, recommendations and, and things like that and there is a preparatory program as well but no you do not need to go to college um to go to the academy it is a college it's a four-year degree right um um, and you get your college education there. Yep. Yeah. For more information, go airforce.com. Airforce.com. Yeah. Check it out. Um, and uh, I know we've mentioned it again throughout the show, but just in case you missed it, um, you can go to college also and still be enlisted. Um, you don't have to be an officer if you have a college degree. I think when we were scrolling, maybe um, somebody had asked about they have an associate's degree, but they don't necessarily want to go the officer path, and I think that's totally fine. We have a lot of enlisted members who have college educations, and right. and um, like me personally, I have my college degree, and I love being enlisted. I right. love everything about it. Um, I don't want to be an officer, and it's nothing against officers, but I just – this is the path that I chose, and I, I've enjoyed my service as an enlisted member. And so, um, again, it's all about – all these different experiences and backgrounds and and where people come from and you know whether it's age or or education and applying that that to whatever you choose to do and it just really makes us obviously right. the best air force she ever. said um, she said she had 
somebody in her basic training flight who was a knee surgeon. Dang, yeah, yeah man. <laughs> now, you know, maybe that knee, maybe maybe we need the knee surgeon <laughs> to be a knee surgeon, <laughs> but if you don't want to be a knee surgeon anymore, <laughs> then I'm done. That's all right. I'm that's all right. Up. You can you can take <laughs> pictures like me in public affairs. You can be on podcasts. We'll take you. Yeah. We'll take you. <laughs> awesome. And what would be the closest career field related to mechanic? I'm going to say mechanic. Mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> no. mechanic. We yeah, have a lot of We have of career lots fields. of mechanics. Yeah. Lots of mechanics. So we have a lot of mechanics. Everything from working on aircrafts, mm-hmm. working on aircraft engines, working on aircraft, um, I guess, parts that help the aircraft get started. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of times people just think aircraft. We actually have carts that need to help the aircraft. Mm-hmm. We have hydraulic carts, light carts, all kind of different things that you vehicles, can work on. Yeah. Vehicles. Uh, there's so many different ways you can be a mechanic in the Air Force. And here's the best part about it is we're always looking for mechanics. Mm-hmm. So if you want to be a mechanic and you call the recruiter and say, hey, I want to be a mechanic, you are speaking their language. Yep. So. They'll be like, come on down. <laughs> the, you, the price is right here. You yeah. Come on down. <laughs> come Who's on. the next contestant? Yeah. I'm going in pretty soon for 1D7X1A. Is it true all of the 1D7 shreds have been combined? I think they're talking about the 3D and the, the 1Ds. Yeah, I think the uh, all, the, all the 3D career fields. Cyber. Was that cyber? Cyber. But I don't or think computers. they're all combined. Not cyber, but. I think that they just merged over to a new AFSC, but I don't think they're combined. I could be wrong. I, I'm, I may not be giving you the best information. I know that they used to be 3D career fields, but now they're 1D. But mm-hmm. I don't. I still think that they're separated in in the actual job. Like different shred outs, mm-hmm. so you can. I can actually talk something. to that a little bit because um, our office worked with the cyber CFMs a lot, the career field managers. Okay. And I know. Um, I I don't know for certain if they've all been combined into like one or anything like. That, but I know that they're in the works. They're doing some. Um, they're kind of condensing down the shreds a little bit, so not all combined into one. But I know they are lessening the number of shreds. So I think, you know, I think there used to be like somewhere between like nine to 10 and now they're, I think they're shrinking it down a bit. Um, Someone could check me on that, but I know they're not, it's not combined all into like one or anything like that, but they are trying to like lessen the number of shreds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, A lot of the, I believe it's like the 3D and 3D1 career fields, they have converted over to the, um, the, what is it? The 1D7s. And then they are, instead of being individual career fields, they are shredding out. So they'll all be under the one. Um, AFSC or Air Force Specialty Code Umbrella, and then they'll just be kind of shreds within the one. Oh, um, so everybody will hold this. Yeah. Everybody will hold the same AFSC, just a different shred? Yeah, it'll be different shreds as opposed to kind of each uh, individual career field. Um, and then I think there's even kind of been talks of even condensing down even more. So, um, yeah, just kind of be prepared that cyber is kind of going through a lot of changes. Wow. That's, Interesting. that's the Air Force always changing, <laughs> yeah, always though. Changing. I mean, I came in as a graphics um, troop, so I was doing Photoshop. That, that was my job right. when I first joined, and then I became a broadcaster. And then um, my ex-husband, uh, I met him in the military, and he was a photographer, and that used to be under the comm squadron. Right. And then that merged with public affairs, and then they merged with the journalists. Right. So journalists and, and everything all together, and then now we're all the same. So I write stories, um, I shoot video, uh, I run websites, I run the social media for ATC. Um, so so that change happens. So just because you join as one thing, you know, the Air Force is going to put you where they, they need you. And, mm-hmm. again, that's why the ASV- ASVAB, I think, is so important because – uh, some people, you know, they might they might um, merge the career fields, but if your ASVAB isn't what the minimum was, oh, sometimes no. they won't let you be that, and you have to go somewhere else, or you're just you might struggle a little bit um, just because it was set at something higher, and you might not have the aptitude for it. So that's why I recommend just really preparing for it as much as possible, so that you're you're set up for success. Because I know um, one of my merges happened in my technical training. Right. So I went all the way through tech school and then they were like, oh, sorry, um, we're going to put you somewhere else. And so some people had to find a completely oh new gosh. job. Um, and so we obviously don't want that to happen. Right. Um, 
but it does happen and so I think studying for that ASVAB and really you know not just going for what like oh I want to do this job and here's the minimum for it so I'll just try to get that I think really trying to get the best that you can get is going to set you up for right. success later Maximize. on so yep that's that's interesting all right it says is there placement test for civilian jobs working with the air force okay did y'all have to do any placement tests prior to working for the air force in in my experience we didn't have to take specific tests. testimony you can check me on this but um and i don't think there is like like an asvab for like civilian but i know if you do so we talked about like our path through like the internship program um but there's also just like applying for a civilian job through like usa jobs I believe there's that aspect too and i think you know it kind of de- it'll depend on like the listing for each job but sometimes they'll have you do like you know like um, questionnaires or take like certain um, assessments and things like that but there isn't some sort of one that that i know of that's like some bl- like a blanket one like right. ASVAB that all civilians have to take or something like that okay <laughs> all right uh next question is the Air Force still going to have the rated board this June? It was pushed back already. My son has his package in. If not, the Marines are testing him now. Better oh, no. get on that. Mm-mm, you're coming with us. You're coming with us. You know anything about that, Major Lane? <clears throat> yeah, we we um, we got our recruiter in the green room. We're asking him now. Uh, he said, yes, the board is on schedule. Okay. Board is on schedule. All good, right. Good. Don't, hold off on the Marines. Let's give a round of applause for Sergeant Irwin <laughs> in the background. <laughs> So hold off on the Marines. The board is on schedule. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. Is there a way to talk to people already doing a job you're interested in at the Guard base you want to join? Yes, definitely. The Guard, um, they let you go around on a tour, basically, of the jobs you're interested in. And they let you meet the people in the shops, kind of get a feel on what they do day to day. So if you're already talking with the guard recruiter and you're trying to figure out your job, um, just ask them, can you get one of those tours? Um, but at least let them know what you're interested in as well. Don't just try to go on a, on a full tour of the base. <laughs> like limit it down, find about you know, maybe three to five jobs you're interested in, and then ask the recruiter to take you around. All right. This is for the civilians. I'm currently an MBA student interning at an aerospace and defense company. Where do I go to apply for the AFCS internship? So I b- believe you would go to the Air Force Civilian Service website, um, but I'm not. I'm not sure. You so probably. I think you'd be able to find information on it there. And I know um, it's been a while since I've went on USA Jobs, but I know sometimes they actually post. Um, like listings for this is like an internship position like in USA jobs so you can actually kind of filter by that I believe it's been a while since I've logged on but I think you can do that too um, so that would probably be the best way to see and then like you mentioned um, the Air Force Civilian Careers website should um, theoretically have info on that too I believe okay yes in USA yeah, jobs I was, just actually, yeah. I was quickly googling <laughs> Um, but yeah, on the Air Force Civilians career site, it looks like kind of under the menu, there's like a student section and it looks like kind of anything related to kind of PSIP pack or if you're like a current student or about to be a grad, it looks like they have some resources there. So that might be a, a good place to start. Okay. Awesome. Thank you all so much. All right. Are civilian jobs continuously open for applications? I would say so. I would say they're hiring constantly. Um, You would just have to go, like they say, USA Jobs has um, a lot of different ways you can serve or or work in the civilian jobs. Also, the Air Force Civilian Service website, um, you'll be able to see jobs there as well. Um, And they're constantly going to be cycling through jobs, so you just see what what they're hiring for Mm -hmm. and apply. So it is a little bit different than, like, applying for maybe a civilian position in that you can't, Sometimes I don't know if you can just submit your application, but generally there has to be an actual job open right. for you um, to apply for it. And that USA Jobs website usually has that on there. Um, so, you know, if you go to work at like a retail store, you can just they can have it on file. I don't think that's really how it works um, for the civilians. Um, but typically you'll see those advertisements and then it's open to everybody right. to apply. You'll just have to upload your resume and things like that. So. 
Is there age waivers for chaplains, Army, Reserves, and National Guard, as well as Navy Reserves are currently commissioning qualified candidates over 40? Just checking all my options as I live in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Uh, yeah, that's um, – yeah, I think they do. The, the chaplains? I'm not sure. You guys did just they, interviewed the chaplains lo- like two weeks ago. Come on. Did they, did they say <laughs> – so I would definitely recommend going back and watching the Chaplain uh, yeah. show we did. Yeah. It's on um, the Air Force Recruiting Services YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. So if you go under the um, back and forth playlist, you'll be able to uh, search through the shows we've done in the past. But we did a whole show on chaplains. I believe they ha- they do have age uh, waivers for candidates over 40 for the chaplains. And I will also recommend that you um, – that you – you call the uh, Air Force um, number or go to AirForce.com and they'll get you squared away. I forgot. I forgot the age. Listen, okay, so the new plan. Cerny's going to come back <laughs> and me and him are going to move me out. <laughs> I'm out. I lost my seat. <laughs> Listen, that's okay. We'll forgive this one time. I'll forgive you. It's because you're nervous because I'm here. <laughs> everything's, everything's off. I'm sorry. Yep. I messed it all up. <laughs> that's what it is. Uh, Look. What are the requirements now to become an officer besides having a bachelor's degree? Uh, be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, that I can't speak on that. So bachelor's, you're gonna need a bachelor's degree. Mm-hmm. You're gonna also need to take an AFOQT mm-hmm. and get some recommendations. So Major Lane, what else would they need beyond the AFOQT and the um in the bachelor's degree? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so you definitely need to take the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test. That's what AFOQT stand for, for in, just in case we haven't said that already. Um, you need your bachelor's degree, but then you will have to apply um, to a uh, officer assessment program. That's either through officer training school, the academy, or uh, ROTC. So uh, with the academy, you typically do that like coming fresh out of high school. They have some programs. If you don't have dependents, you can go there, but to get to the academy, you do have to have a, um, a, I think, a congressional letter of recommendation or a recommendation from somebody who graduated from the academy. Um, I, I think there's a rank on that. So I want to say a, a 06 or higher, if I'm not mistaken. But to go through officer training school, we have boards, mm-hmm. typically two boards a year, and you will apply for that board. If you're a civilian through a recruiter, if you're prior enlisted, you would do that through your education office or your NPF. And then for ROTC, which I think is a pretty sweet deal, all you got to do is be a full-time student at a university that offers Air Force ROTC, and you will take ROTC as an elective class. So your commitment will be anywhere from two to three days a week. The summer before your, uh, the summer after your sophomore year, you would go to their version of basic training, which is called field training. And then once you graduate from um, field training, you'll come back, you'll contract, and then after your four-year degree you will commission as an officer so that's essentially it and there's lots of um scholarships available for those programs as well so oh and um sergeant Ern in the background said be primarily healthy a 2.5 plus gpa within one year of graduating with bachelor's so that's that is for ots ots uh to apply for ots you can apply if you are a year out thanks sergeant Ern. thank you sergeant Irwin. All right. Thank goodness for him. <laughs> Next question. How hard is it to transition to officer after enlisten- enlisting? Oh, Major Lane again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty hard. Um, you got to be a, a really good amateur. So I'll, get, I'll give you the advice that my first flight chief when I back around security forces told me. He was like, um, if you want to – do different opportunities in the military than do good at what you're currently doing, right? So be really good at what you're currently doing. And so um, when you're trying to cross over, one, you have to be within a year out. Two, your GPA needs to be good in college. But then three, you need to be a pretty good, um, you need to be a pretty good airman as well because they're going to look at all your 
annual reports. They're gonna um, they're gonna um, have an interview process. You're gonna have to get a letter of recommendation. Your commander's gonna have to approve it. And so ultimately, you do a really good job at your current job, and you also want to have leadership qualities as well too. So any opportunities where you can lead, like when I was putting in for OTS, I was doing a lot of coaching. Um, I, I told my commander I wanted to go to OTS, so he made me the flight chief for services and contracting. So I I was kind of leading a group there. But your application, you want to show that you're able to be a leader and if you can do those things you'll get picked up uh, and fill out that long application <laughs> but she got her hand up what's going on sergeant guillot hey team so one of the cool things to understand as well is the amount of opportunities that exist within the enlisted corps if you want to be an officer cool fantastic i'm looking at going that route here in the next couple of years however comma um as a public affairs troop myself uh, I have operated outside of just the PA realm probably a dozen and one time since coming in. So there's what we call developmental special duties, DSDs. Yes, we love our acronyms in the military, which is what I'm in right now as an MTI. There's also the capability to be military training leaders, so your tech school instructors, um, to be a reservist, or excuse me, a recruiter, not a reservist. Yes, you can transition between active and reserve as well but there's a lot of different opportunities for growth in the enlisted side outside of your specific career field. There's obviously the opportunity to cross train at specific points in time, which you're going to go through a career assistance advisor for, which is another in, another route that you can go at some point in time, given the opportunities, setting yourself up, getting those high as VAB scores, continuing to excel in your current job, um, and getting those recommendations from leadership that, hey, this individual's real good at what they do in lieu of saying real hot at what they do. Um, but don't get hung up on just, I have to do this one job or I have to commission. There is a plethora of opportunities available to you on both sides of the spectrum, right. light and if you call it the dark side for officers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, and good luck on your process. I I, I want to see this go all the way through, so I'm sending all my all my mm -hmm. wishes to you. Yeah. Um, if you all hear like water dripping, it's because it's raining out here right now. It's crazy raining. Yeah. So lightning, thunder, everything is going on right now. So if you hear it, uh, just giving you all a heads up that we're in the middle of a tsunami. No, I'm just yeah. Kidding. It's fine. <laughs> just sh we're sheltered in place. It's okay. We're fine. No. <laughs> Not that crazy, but if, if anybody's familiar with Texas, when it rains, it rains. It rains. It rains. So it, we're in that, that not quite as, I just came from Luke Air Force Base, and they have monsoon season. So it's not, I wouldn't say we have monsoon season here, but it it rains here yeah. for sure, for sure. No monsoons. So <laughs> no monsoons. Knock on wood. No. <laughs> All right. If you enlist with a degree. The timing on that thunder. I know. That was good. It knew. We scheduled that in advance. <laughs> If you enlist with a degree, what rank can you potentially graduate BMT with? So the furthest you can get um, with a degree joining the enlisted side is enlisted grade three. Um, so if you have 45 um, college semester hours or more, that lets you come in as an E3. So with a bachelor's degree, I mean, you're going to have definitely over 45 semester hours. So the most you can get is E3, which is about $300 extra a month. So it gives you something, hooks you up. There, there are a few exceptions, right? Does the band? Oh, so the band will. The band. The 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 uh, the Air Force band. What's mm -hmm. the what's the other name for it? Premier band. Mm -hmm. They can uh, join up to an E six, mm -hmm. or they they actually not up to an E six. They come in as an E six. Technical um, sergeant, right? Yeah. Yep, as a technical sergeant. So that's the only way you'll come in. But recently, the Air Force just um, I'm, I know that this isn't news that we that we put on the show, but recently the Air Force is allowing people to come in with certain cyber certificates. Hmm. They're allowing them to come up to an E4 if oh, you have okay. certain cyber certificates. Um, mm -hmm. So get with your recruiters. Mm -hmm. Also, you can go on the airforce.com website, try to get more information about that. If you have the proper certificates, they are allowing them to come in up to an E4. So okay. that's pretty cool. And then if you have prior service. 
oh, sometimes yeah. that can get you E4 or, or something as it, well. Mostly they try to put you back in the rank that you had. Right. Um, if it's but, a similar yeah. career field, right. They okay. just got to run the numbers and make sure everything adds up, but mm -hmm. yeah. So there's lots of opportunities. I think um, it's confusing. Sometimes I'm even confused on all the opportunities and I'm public affairs, so I'm supposed to be telling everybody <laughs> about these opportunities. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what are we talking about? But but it's it's as um, Sergeant Giat said, there's just so many opportunities for you. I know we keep saying opportunities over and over again, but that's what they are um, to do really kind of anything that you want um, in the Air Force, whether you're enlisted or officer. Right. So it's it's been it's been a fun mm -hmm. ride for 17 years, and I know a lot of people have had um, similar experiences and, and got to see the world and travel and do a bunch of things. So, yeah. Yep. All right. Can you reach E3? Sorry, I just, like, can't read. Can <laughs> you reach E3 if you're going reserves and a six-year contract? So the reserve, uh, as, as far as I know, um, and I, I was reading something that I was confused about. It, it almost read like the reserve is allowing four-year contracts now, but I, I, I'm not going to go into that. Um, but it's, you know, based off of history, the reserve in the Guard only allowed six-year contracts. Um, so because you were doing a six-year, um, I guess it automatically allowed you to come in with the E3 as well um, because six-year contracts for the Air Force give you E3 after you finish tech school or after 20 weeks of service. So hopefully that answered your question. Let's see what else we got here. All right. Fix yeah, I know. Oh. Um, oh. So we're gonna we're at our 15 minute mark, oh. um, and we're gonna go into our lightning round. So Ooh. this is the time when we try to answer the questions as fast as possible. I uh, know from history. Wrong answers only. No, from, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. From history, I've always been a little slow, so I'm trying to get faster. Um, so this is our time, um, even for our guests, to try to answer the question as quickly as possible. So we're gonna start now. See how many we can get through. My son will be graduating at the age of 19, started college at 15. Is there an age requirement for the officer's program for the reserves? Wow. First Dang. off, that's awesome. Um, so it's still going to be 17 to 39. Um, so if he's 19 years old, he should be within the age requirements. Mm -hmm. Just got to get with the recruiter and uh, figure out the process to get started. Mm -hmm. What else we got? How much does an officer make straight out of officer, officer school? That is um, easily Googleable. I won't know that number <laughs> right off top, um, but I would say Google uh, Air Force Officer Pay. Uh, and the website that I use, I don't think I'm sponsoring anybody or anything, but Navy CS, if you see a Navy CS website, they have a really good chart that breaks it down pretty easily for you to mm -hmm. understand. Um, you can see enlisted in officer pay. Just mm -hmm. Google Air Force officer pay. Yeah, everybody makes, um, not everybody makes the same amount, but depending on your rank and time in service, there's a chart. It goes by every two years. Everybody makes the same um, besides maybe some special pay and allowances. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we're, it's all out there. You guys know how much we make. It's out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the delayed entry program? Registered nurse for 11 years here. So the delayed entry program um, you're not just going to go to a recruiter's office and go to basic training or office of training school tomorrow. There is a process where you're waiting for a job to happen. So that's called the delayed entry program. It's basically after you've already taken the ASVAB or the AFOQT and you've already been through MEPS and now you're just waiting. Um, that is the delayed entry program. That can take um, the maximum amount of time you can wait in a delayed entry program is 12 months. So you have to get out of the delayed entry, entry program before the 12 month mark. Hopefully. I, I know this is a lightning round, but also I'll say it's not just waiting. Your recruiter should, you know, take you maybe work on some physical things, take you on tours to the base or whatever, and just get you kind of familiar. So I think it's a great opportunity right. to really kind of get indoctrinated, right. and, you know, like get familiar with how the Air Force is going to be before you're actually in it. Right. So it's not it's, just waiting. You're not like just sitting around. Development you know, as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, Um, I know we're in lightning round, but do you remember your depth? Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and I went early because I had a... Um, I had a, a different job. I was going to be an aerial gunner, and that's, mm -hmm. like, what I wanted to do. And then um, my recruiter had a spot open up, 
somebody got disqualified and so I left like they were like just go like two weeks later I like packed up my whole apartment and went so um, I think I joined in maybe like January and I wasn't supposed to leave until September for Ariel Gunner whatever school that is and I ended up leaving in May so it so, was a pretty quick so about five four, yeah four to five months yeah maybe I joined in March I don't I don't remember but um, it was it was a quick amount of time that I had to wait just because things like that happen you may have a job that yes it's guaranteed but something could pop up and right if you want it take it you take it yeah. Go and I was looking. To, I'm from Nebraska, so I kind of <laughs> wanted to leave. Um, I love Nebraska now, and I would go back in a heartbeat. But at the time, I was like, "Yep, let's I'll go. Take it. Let's go. So. I'll take it." <laughs> yeah. All right. This hey, Jody, is Aircraft Loadmaster in demand or have openings often? Also, what are a couple jobs the Air Force needs fill right now? So, Loadmaster. It has a huge demand from from the civilian population, um, but as far as the supply that the Air Force has, it's very limited because so many people want to be a loadmaster. Um, so that's one of the jobs that I always tell people, if that's the only thing you want to do, um, you're going to have a hard time getting into the Air Force just because of the limited job um, slots. Um, I know your second question was what kind of jobs is the Air Force having demand right now? I would say uh, anything maintenance, uh, anything as far as linguists goes, special warfare career fairs or career fields, and what else would be in demand? Um, what'd you say? Special warfare. Special warfare. Yeah, so special warfare, linguists, mechanical career fields. Those are going to be your most in demand career fields. And in cop in uh, security forces. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be all in-demand career fields. What does the first six months look like when you join? Um, I mean, I can speak on my experience really quick. Um, that was 17 years ago, but um, I didn't understand that I wasn't just leaving for basic training. It was six weeks at the time that um, I was just going to, I thought I was just going to be gone for six weeks. I didn't like understand the process, I guess. And maybe it was explained to me, but I didn't quite like get it. So I went straight, you go straight from basic training to your technical training. Right. Um, and all I had was my backpack with my one t shirt and jeans, you know. So um, I think be prepared for that, that you're going to go to tech school and you're going to wear um, a uniform. And I don't know if they, I don't think they still do phases. I don't know how the phases work, but you know, you get to tech school and the, when you first get there, you're still kind of in basic training mode, but not as intense. And it just gets like a little bit more introducing you into the regular right. air force. Um, and then depending my tech school, I mean, my story's complicated, so I won't go too much into it, but, um, you know, if it's a shorter tech school, then you'll go to your first base and, and get first term airman training and things like that. But sometimes you might be in tech school for a long time or go to a second technical training. It just really depends on your job. Right. Um, but it's really learning how to be in the Air Force and learning those basic skills. So I see a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't have experience in that. The Air Force literally teaches you exactly how to do it. You have you don't need any experience necessarily for the enlisted side anyway. Um, maybe the, even the officer side. Um, you need no experience. The Air Force will teach you everything you need to know about it. That was uh, that was something that I didn't I understood it, but I didn't understand it because I got a maintenance career uh, when I first started. Mm -hmm. And I was like, do they understand? Like, I don't have any maintenance background. Like, right. Do you want me to like fix yeah. this multi-million dollar jet engine? I don't think they understand me? it. You want me to do right. that? But that's why the ASVAB, it's not a test on like what you know. It's a test on what can you learn. Right. How how well will you learn how to do this? And if you're not doing well on a certain section, that doesn't mean you're not smart. It means you maybe don't have what it, you know, like a maintenance aptitude right. and you might be better suited for a different career field. So um, that's why I think it's really important to prep for that and, and um, you know, take it very seriously. Right. I also just want to add really quick, kind of while we're, while we're on that topic, um, there's like a really great tool also on airforce.com. So I think Andrew mentioned earlier that there's kind of some like sliders where you can, you know, choose a certain mage composite score and kind of see which careers you would be eligible for based on um, scoring high enough, but there's also a career assessment tool that's also available and hosted on airforce.com. And it's a great way because I know there's been a couple of questions where people are asking about, oh, well, what are some similar jobs, you know, to like a mechanic, for example, or even like the loadmaster question. Um, and so I would kind of direct them to uh, consider taking what's called the AFWIN. So it's the Air Force Work Interest Navigator. Um, and there's a link to it on airforce.com. 
it's a great way to kind of just see like kind of based on your work preferences and interests. So, it, you know, it kind of spans from, you know, do you enjoy kind of being like outdoors versus like, would you rather kind of work more of an office desk job to um, kind of just like the daily tasks that you would be interested in um, doing. And you kind of answer about a 20 minute survey and then it'll give you kind of a, a personalized report of kind of your top ranked jobs that you know would be potentially good fit for you kind of based on um, your work preferences and kind of what you would be interested in um, for certain jobs and then you can also factor in your ASVAB scores into that too to kind of see um, kind of where you might be eligible for. Right. So it's a great way to kind of get an idea of other jobs that you might not even know that are similar to something you'd be interested in, as well as just seeing what's out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. AF wins. All yeah, right. Yeah, AF W-I-N. Awesome. I had asthma at two years old. Do you guys think it was a good idea to get a PFT in advance for MEPS in case they ask for it? I've seen online that they ask for one to be done, and how long is it good for? I'm assuming he means physical fitness tests. So pulmonary function. Oh, pulmonary. Function. pulmonary. Yeah. See, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Definitely get the pulmonary function done um, prior to seeing a recruiter because they're going to make you have to get one anyway, um, and you just have the medical records on file. That way, if when they ask, you have it ready to go. So. Good job on you. Yeah, especially if you're trying to leave, you know, soon. But. Right. The medical can hold them up. It can mm -hmm. slow down the process. So the more records they get ahead of time, speeds it up. For sure. For sure. Can I get the BMT video for my son, 17, and wanting to join next year? Can I get the BMT video? The one video? that we just shared? Oh, I think she's talking about the physical fitness one with Sergeant mm. Guillaume in it. No, I think she's talking about the... Um, the BMT overview we did. Oh, so the overview. Part, mm -hmm. Oh, so the BMT overview that we did. Uh, that's a part of a series we actually filmed here at our headquarters recruiting. And if you go to either AFRS.com and uh, type in BMT, you can watch it there. But um, also too, they're on our YouTube channel as well. But yes, the, you can. It's the, there's a whole series. So that was the overview. I think we did like four. I think we did like every week of basic training. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely a long yeah. shoot. But but yeah, uh, there's a whole series out there that you can watch on our YouTube channel or airforce.com. Awesome. Thank you, Major Lane. Maybe he, we should hire him instead. He has all the answers. <laughs> Major Lane from the background. <laughs> all right. I'm supposed to ship out next week. I'm not sure how to feel about it, but I'm super excited to be a part of the U.S. Air Force. It's been a dream of mine for the last 10 years. That's exciting. Awesome. Oh, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, should I be worried about training as an older recruit? I think we talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, I don't think so. so I think... I, I don't think so either. No, as long – I'm honestly in better shape now than I was at 20. Um, maybe I don't feel like it some days, but, um, yeah, I think I think those folks with the experience shouldn't yeah. be worried about it. I think it might even be less stressful for you, um, especially because you've probably been away from home before. So right. all of the things that maybe the younger recruits have anxiety about, you don't have to worry about so much about that. So I would say that. Yeah. Unless Sergeant Guillaume has something else to say. Not really. I mean, y'all hit the nail on the head. It's the mindset. And so it is just, you know, going into it with the understanding that you're not going to do anything right. right. Um, and kind of internalizing that and learning to be okay with it, that it's not, none of it is personal. Um, it's all just very, very loud feedback the entire time. I, I hear you. Everybody's I, getting feedback. Right. Everybody. <laughs> Focus and focus on the dream. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, sorry, I, not Sergeant, I think Amanda had a fan in here. Um, said, way to go, Amanda. Somebody said, way to go. <laughs> Dang, fans. I have a question about the ASVAB. I have done the retest ASVAB, but now have to take a confirmation test. They told me it's another full ASVAB. Any one of you know if it's about the same questions? So the confirmation test happens when you score... So if you if you didn't do well on the first one and then you went and took the retest and you scored 20 points or higher, then they make you take a confirmation test. Um, but it shouldn't be a full um, ASVAB. The confirmation test is just trying to confirm that there wasn't any funny business going on. Um, so it should be a shorter version. Um, but, 
you know, I could be wrong, but I definitely think it's going to be a shorter version for you uh, to take a, a confirmation just to confirm nothing funny happened. Can my son join the DEP, which is the delayed entry program, at 17? So, yes, but it's going to need your uh, consent. So any 17-year-old trying to join is going to need parental consent from both parents unless there's only one act active parent. Um, unless that child has been emancipated, and then they can join with their emancipation paperwork. But beyond that, they need um, parental consent. What are the age range to join active for or for the Air Guard? So that's going to be uh, 17 to 39. Got to go to basic training before your 40th birthday. And that's go, not graduate? Got to be in basic training. In basic yep. training before your 40th birthday. So we're going to do 10 more questions, you all. And then that's going to be the end of the show. So 10 more, we're going to try to do rapid, rapid. Remember, if we Super don't get rapid. your questions answered, you have the QR code on the screen. You also have that phone number. Those people are working around the clock um, trying to get your questions answered. So you can always call them or you can scan that QR code. It'll take you to airforce.com. And you can also go to the Aim High web or uh, app <coughs> to get all your information. So there's so many ways you can get these questions answered. Um, and, and, and this show happens every other Tuesday. So from this Tuesday... Not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after next, we're going to do the show again. So you can come back and ask your questions then. All right, what do we got next? Let me get these out of the way. I bought a prep book from Amazon for mm -hmm. the AFOQT to start studying for it. Are those reliable and sufficient study materials to excel? So, so it's really going to come down to, I always say it comes down to a person. So how much are you going to put into the book? Um, because all the books are going to work. Um, any any online stuff, all the stuff works. It's just going to come down to how much you're putting into it. Some of them are, are easier to read for certain people. Some of them, you know, some people like a more rigid one. Um, but it just depends on how much work you're going to put into it. So put in the work, and then you should see the results. Oh, uh, in... And for Amanda and Andrew, was there anything uh, that you all had to add to that? Um, no, I would kind of just echo what you said and then kind of a lot of the, the kind of the prep tips we gave earlier where really it's kind of just getting in the habit of kind of learning what the, the question types are, figuring out kind of how to answer them, um, just knowing like what you're bad at. You know, I think, you know, there's kind of that tendency to lean towards like, I'm really good at, you know, these types of questions. I'm kind of just rocking and rolling through these questions and then you kind of tend to like oh i know i'm not good at this section but i don't want to work through it because it's a little bit difficult so kind of trying to overcome kind of that bias towards you know focusing on what you're already kind of good at and kind of maybe tailoring your study more to areas that you know that you know you might need more prep time on so right andrew anything no, i think amanda kind of nailed hit the nail on the head there so i think yeah like like you guys mentioned already, it's just going to be, you know, you get you get what you put into it. So that, that's really going to be the biggest part. Awesome. All right. Next question. I am. A, oh, it went away. I am a slow test taker. This is like a trick for me, I think. Like, how am I doing? I'm a slow test taker and I know time is of the essence during the AFOQT. Do you have any tips or suggestions on how to go through it efficiently? Amanda. Uh, I would say too, like, you know, feel free to kind of skip around in the test through the questions and you can always kind of go back. So don't, you know, don't spend too much time on any one question. Um, it'll, you know, it'll display how many total questions are in the section. So kind of use that to kind of keep yourself accountable. You can always kind of go back and review ones that you might have skipped. Um, so don't kind of get bogged down by, you know, the, the first three questions because you've got kind of the rest of the, the section to take. Um, and then if anything, you know, it's worth guessing because there's, you know, I know some standardized tests, there's like a penalty for doing that. Um, you might as well <laughs> guess um, rather than leave things blank. So kind of uh, what I would recommend for kind of any standardized testing. And then practice, practice the time limit while you're doing your right. prep. It goes by quicker than you probably realize. Yeah. Except yeah. for Amanda when she had her five hour test, she thought it was only <laughs> going to be two hours. <laughs> 
other than that. Yeah, it, it felt like more than five hours even. Well, I got to I got to finish it the next day. I was allowed yeah. to go home. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is uh, Major Lane from the background again. <laughs> um, so I would definitely recommend practicing the test with the time limits that are allotted for each section. And then also, too, like Amanda said, um, one of the biggest advices that I got when I took it, because I'm a slow test taker as well, was that you're not penalized for the ones you get wrong. You get credit for the ones you get right. So if you get down to, like, two minutes, one minute, and you got a bunch of blanks, fill those bad boys in because you don't want to leave anything blank. But that that would be my advice. Thank you, Major. All right. Uh, so once we have taken the AFOQT, how soon do we get the score, and what would be the next step? Ooh, uh, Amanda, how, how soon do they get the score after they've taken it? So it can kind of depend. I think you usually get your score kind of fairly quickly within, you know, a couple of, of days, um, but it can kind of kind of vary. Um, and then in terms of kind of next steps after it, um, kind of depending on what you're interested, like what jobs you're interested in going to. So I kind of mentioned earlier, so if you're, for example, interested in being like a pilot or a remote pilot, um, it doesn't stop at AFOQT, unfortunately. You do have to take the TBAS, the test of basic aviation skills to get that score. Um, and then you'll basically take those scores as well as if you have any prior flying hours and then that all gets combined into what's called a PICSUM score which is the pilot candidate selection method score and then that kind of gets factored into um, the whole uh, pilot selection process so the name kind of gives it away you know PICSUM pilot selection um, so kind of depending on what you're interested in there might be kind of some additional testing that's required um, but otherwise, kind of just wait for your AFOQT scores to come in and kind of depending, too, on like what accession you're applying from, um, that'll kind of dictate what next steps there are. So I know for OTS, if you're kind of going up for an OTS board, you're basically building a whole application package. You got to you know give yourself enough time to get those recommendation letters, get your application filled out, get your resume in a good spot. Um, all that kind of stuff. So it kind of depends on kind of what your interests are, where you're interested in going as like an officer. Right. Thank you, ma'am. I am currently active Army enlisted with three years left, but I want to become an Air Force officer. When should I start talking to a recruiter? Currently with three years left, but I want to become an Air Force officer. So prior service. Hmm. Well, well, Sergeant, current service. Sergeant Irwin be able to help with that one? Green to blue. Yeah, tell him to go on mute. He said now maybe get a conditional release. So 368 will be a conditional release. Um, Sergeant Erden, if if you, if you want to come off mute, you can you can uh, explain it. Oh, you know what? Let me do this. I gotta I gotta assign. You gotta assign. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so we we got Sergeant Irwin. Uh, he's in the background background. So we're trying <laughs> the to extra background. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah. So if you if your command is willing to sign you a conditional release of DD Form three six eight, you can start now. Uh, but it's really up to your commander. You know whether they're going to allow you to release release you from your current Army contract early to apply for Air Force, or if they're going to hold you to that. So it really depends uh, on your current leadership. Otherwise, you know, definitely like a year out um, from your separation date, go ahead and start the process at that time. Thank you, Sergeant Irwin. Hmm. All right. Oh, look, I got fans now, too. Oh, I know look, they can't see it, but I got fans. Where was that? I missed I got it. Fans. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what's next here. All right. Y'all being nice. Is that... Is that twenty thousand steps every single day of BMT? <laughs> is that is that every day, Sergeant Giat? Hey, sir. Sometimes it's more. You know, <laughs> it, uh, depends on where we got to go, where your uh, your squadron is located, in relation to everything else on base. So, move. You got to right. move. You got to you got to be active, and because that's where we see the stress fractures come from. Is that heightened amount of mobility? So. Yeah. Darn near close. Everybody else's New Year's resolution is a day in the life of an MTI or a trainee. Yeah. And things like a Apple Watch or like a Steps Tracker, those things aren't allowed in basic training. 
No, sir. No smart devices. Okay. So the old Casio or one with the Mickey Mouse hand that goes right. around. Nothing, <laughs> nothing real, real smart. Got it. Uh, and one thing that I was very impressed with uh, about basic training is that they have found a way to make it uphill both ways. Uh, so, cause the bridges over the roads. So oh. when you're on your way there, you go up the, you got to go up over the bridge. And then mm -hmm. when you're on your way back, you got to go back, back up, up over the bridge. <laughs> so, so they've found a way to right. make it uphill both ways. So that's pretty impressive. Yep. Pretty impressive. <laughs> I remember I got my duffel bag with all of my clothing and we had to walk back to the, uh, to the dorms with mm -hmm. that duffel bag, yeah. man. And you're like trying not to fall backwards. <laughs> I was 139 pounds, six feet tall. <laughs> And I got this big old backpack. Nope. Yeah. Mm -mm. <laughs> I made it. Yep. We, I made it. <laughs> everybody will, will make it. It's fine. We got it. We got it. I oh, made it. goodness. Let's see what's next here. Five more questions. Five, five more. more questions. Whew, that was only five. Okay. Do you still need to go to OTS if you want to sign up as reserved and want to be an officer? Mm hmm. Going to need to go to OTS. Any officer path you choose, whether it's guard, reserve, or active duty, you're going to need to. Go to OTS unless you do like a ROTC mm -hmm. um, or um, academy. academy. Mm -hmm. And did they, I think they used to have a separate OTS, but is it all the same OTS now? I don't know if anybody can speak on that, but. Are you talking about like a separate one for the components? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's all together, right? We come together. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do bonuses depend on a new fiscal year, or can you join anytime with them being guaranteed? No, you cannot join anytime with them being guaranteed. Um, I believe they're coming out quarterly. I could be wrong, um, but I think they're coming out quarterly, the bonuses are. Uh, mm -hmm. So you would just get with your recruiter, see what the bonuses are for the quarter, and then you would have to book a job within that, within that quarter to get that bonus. Last three. Last three. My daughter is studying aerospace engineering at San Diego State University. Woo, is there opportunity for internship? I don't know the answer to that. I'm I don't sorry. know that either. Yeah, so, yeah I, don't know if, uh, I don't know about any specific listings right now, but I'd imagine for, um, I know there's, it, like with like the PSIP pack program, there's like a, they ha kind of have like the different areas and one of them is like the science and engineering. And I know um, they're, they're probably gonna be definitely looking for engineers at some point. So I, I would imagine that, you know, if there isn't, if there isn't any listing right now, there, there might be, like, there would definitely be some soon, I would, I would uh, predict. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah so also, too, uh, ROTC is basically a four-year interview or internship to coming in as well. So she's at a university that offers ROTC that, again, your first two years technically in ROTC you're not on contract so I guess you can technically look at that as an internship and then once you go to field training that summer after your second year um, and, you, and you graduate field training and you come back that, for that third year that's when they you go on contract and you start picking what careers you want to do so technically ROTC is at least the first two years it's like an internship thank you major all right all right Last two, is it true they make relationships in the Air Force? Is it true they make relationships in the Air Force? I'm, I don't know if I understand that. Basically, do we get friends or become closer to each other? Oh, like, do we yeah, make... Yeah, camaraderie, yeah. friendships. Yeah. Definitely. I even married somebody in the Air Force, so <laughs> they didn't make me, though. They yeah. They didn't make me. I, um, some of my best friends I met in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So, yes, definitely um, we make friends. Um, I, I see a lot of r marriages happen in the Air Force mm -hmm. as well. Um, so definitely relationships will be made. Because mm -hmm. I think you're all going through something that not a lot of people experience. I mean, it seems like you feel like there's a lot of veterans out there, but really in comparison to the population, um, it's a low percentage. Um, and so all of our experiences are going to be different and unique, but also very similar to each other. And so friends that I've deployed with, you know, I still have those friends. And then you run into people. It's a small Air Force. I know mm -hmm. it seems so large, but um, everywhere I go, oh, do you know this person? Mm -hmm. I knew them. So um, you may be stationed with somebody at your first base and then at your third base again and again, especially in the same career field. So what about the civilian side? What is camaraderie like on you all side? Andrew, Amanda? <laughs> yeah, I would say, I mean, the, 
the camaraderie is really good here too because um i guess we we're in a pretty unique position to where like um i guess i don't know to the what extent other teams are like it too but we have like a good mix of like the the civilian and like the uh military members as well because we have some officers on our team um and i feel like the the camaraderie is really really good too and i think me and amanda got in a uh, pretty lucky position to where we kind of like went through all the pipeline together so there's like the camaraderie in there too so maybe if you if you join like the peace impact program um someone on your team might be going through the same pipeline as you too so that's that's some way to build the camaraderie but i think overall like with the team there's a lot of camaraderie there between civilians and then like civilians and military as well in my experience awesome And I think, um, you know, as a civilian, typically they're going to be in a place longer than the military members. There are opportunities for them to move and take different positions and move around. But generally, civilians kind of like the um, idea that they can stay in one place. And so um, while, you know, they'll make friends with other civilians, you know, they're seeing military members come in, you know, rotating all the time. So they're even making more friends. And some of my best friends um, in the Air Force so far have been civilians that I've been stationed with. So I think for... It's um, for no matter what branch you are um, or component, you know, reservists, et cetera. I think the camaraderie and relationships and friendships are kind of irreplaceable. They are. They make the job. too. Yeah, for sure. Because we're all a team. Mm -hmm. All right. Last question. Last question. How does the school work? I hear that once you join, you might be too busy to go to school. I want to be a PA. Also, can I live at home after basic? I don't know if you mean PA like me or PA like physician assistant. Um, More likely physician assistant. I mean, (laughs) I don't know why you wouldn't want to be like me, but... I guess if you want to be a doctor, that's fine, too. Um, But, yeah, I would say that it really just depends on what career you're in um, and what your duties are and things like that. Um, I know I was able to get um, degrees while I served on active duty, uh, while I was deployed. Um, I I got my associates, the Community College of the Air Force. um, They helped me get my associate's degree, and then I've gotten a bachelor's, and I'm in a master's program right now. So, um, And then there's also lots of school and programs for becoming a PA or a nurse in the Air Force that you can apply to and become an officer. So um, there's lots of opportunities for that. But again, it it really just depends on what career field you're in, I think, and your duty schedule. So yeah, I I think it depends on duty schedule. And then also finding time like you got to find Yeah, you got to find that time in your personal Mm -hmm. schedule now sometimes you got career fields in the air force that you're like hey i'm taking a class and they're like all right go take your class Mm -hmm. but most career fields are going to be like you need to do that on your time Mm -hmm. um so you just got to figure it out where it fits most and how much of a uh, class load you can take some people Mm -hmm. can take one class at a time i've seen some people take four classes at a time Um, so it just depends (laughs) on what you can handle i would say gauge it start with one and just see what you can handle and there's lots of opportunities as well f- to take classes in the Air Force that get you college credits. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's an option as well. Awesome. That's going to be – oh, hold on. We got one more. <laughs> so y'all making Master Sergeant Patterson permanent on here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sergeant Cerny. Oh, wait, no, we're firing. Oh, we're, I'm yeah, we're fired. firing you. I'm we're firing fired. you. <laughs> and me and Major I'll be, Lane and uh, I'll be Sergeant Reed for the background. <laughs> yeah, Sergeant Reed, you'll, you'll be peeking out the window here. We'll like pan to you. You're like, let me in, let me in. <laughs> I got answers. Uh, no, oh, uh, no. I uh, f- just in case you joined late, I am filling in for Sergeant Cerny. I would love to come back anytime you need me, or if you need me as a guest host, and I, I may have some things up my sleeve that I'm working on <laughs> to get myself yeah. <laughs> back on here. Woo! But well, yeah, thank you for yeah, putting I up say, with me. I say that let the let the viewers decide. If we the, can get at least let's 50, vote. if we can leave, if we can get fifty comment sections to say let's keep Sarah Patterson. Yeah, we'll see if we can convince her leadership to let that happen. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. We'll 50 see. Fifty comments and say saying keep Sergeant Patterson, and then we might be able to figure something <laughs> out. Um, but Sergeant Patterson, I do appreciate you filling in for this week. Of course, um, you have made the show great. Uh, this this is a. Uh, Look, the PAs, they're broadcast journalists, like they're so good. Like they do this so they can just come in and just just effortlessly swoop on in here. Yeah. And steal take, your job. Take my job. <laughs> no, but they're good. So um, <laughs> I appreciate you coming on here and uh, and blessing us with your time. Also, big uh, shout out to our guests. Um, to, 
to all of our guests for for coming on here as well sharing your knowledge as well this has been a for great sure. show um and for everybody if you haven't got your question answered just make sure you scan that qr code and like i say that number you can call them and they're working around the clock for you all but like always our next show is going to be in two weeks from now and we appreciate you for coming on thank you for having me it's been great <laughs> awesome <laughs> And thank you to our guests as well. Yeah. Thank you to the guests. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of The Back and Forth brought to you by Headquarters Air Force Recruiting Service. It is a privilege for us to bring you all the information and insider insight into the exciting world of the United States Air Force. Remember, this show is all about you. We want to make sure we're providing you information and answers you need to make an informed decision about your future. So make sure to join us every other Tuesday with your questions, your feedback, and any ideas you have for future episodes. We are all ears. Don't forget to subscribe to our social media channels for even more exciting content. And also visit AirForce.com for all the latest information on serving as a Total Force Airman. And with that, until next time, aim high. <laughs>